my only worry now is mark twain once said the human brain is a one organ which starts to function from the time you are born only to stop when you stand before an audience after a brilliant speaker has spoken to speak now my brain is stopped <clears throat> so from now on i'll be speaking from my spinal reflex friends i have been asked by rita mahajan to speak about the future of medical care system in india so i'll confine myself to that now this i know this is all about quantum physics quantum physics is a new science from the west which tries to understand this universe let me define science my i have my own definition of science science is something which tries to understand this universe how it works science is not something which teaches the universe how it should work the western science which is called the reductionist science the western science which is called the reductionist science is now trying to teach the world how to work i'll give you an example if you don't have a baby now the western science says we will create a baby in the test tube if you can't deliver normally we will take the baby out through the abdomen but we don't realize how we are affecting nature's working i'll give you a simple example for every cell in the human body we have 10 germ cells inside us in other words we are germs actually we have come from germs and we are germs but these germs most of them come when you come out to the mother's genital tract 90% of these germs go in when you come out of the mother's tract rest of them of course are there in your womb in the mother's womb itself now if you take the baby out from here god only knows what will happen to that baby in the future there are not enough studies to say what happens to this cesarean delivered babies but what shocks me is the way we are going a lady doctor came to me the other day <clears throat> and she said in hyderabad city 90% of the women deliver through cesarean section this there's something wrong with our health we do, we call it as health care system no we don't have a health care system we have a health scare system frightening people what we are having is a sickness care industry one of the most lucrative industries in the world is sickness care industry which is three times more powerful than the oil industry you probably don't know it's a multi trillion dollar industry now every industry in one sense in the philosophic sense is a curse on mankind did you know that no 1802 the first industry started in europe to be precise in england and there was this romantic english poet william wordsworth and wordsworth wrote a beautiful poem when the industry was coming up the poem's name is the world is too much with us i'll give you four lines rest you go and read the world is too much with us late and soon getting and spending we seem to have lost our powers little do we see our own thing in nature we have sold our soul to the devil a sordid boon full stop a little while ago the editor of the magazine here a brilliant young lady a great uh, scholar of uh, telugu asked me one question doctor we all look up to doctors as gods but why are our doctors not behaving like gods very pertinent question very pertinent question my answer is very simple whole society has become so corrupt that doctors also come from the same society we are not descending from heaven as a separate entity so if 10% of the society is corrupt 10% of the doctors must be corrupt but unfortunately what happens is there's a great attraction here for my making money and quick money at that so because sickness care has become an industry so it is perforce a law that we doctors also must be commercial so we have become commercial hippocrates whom we claim as the father of modern medicine western medicine has clearly said that we have three roles to play in society remember that cure rarely comfort mostly but console always what a beautiful saying cure rarely you can't cure nothing with your reductionist thinking you can't cure anything but you can comfort most things now what is man's biggest enemy pain 
This has been man's enemy in the past, this is the man's enemy today, and man's enemy in the future. You take any disease under the sun, pain. But today, we have in Western science, reductionist medicines, to allay pain of any kind. You don't have to worry about pain. But without pain, sometimes patients still have a lot of problems and say they are dying. Then Hippocrates said, console always. You know, a dying man is frightened. He doesn't know what's, what's next. Though, of course, someone very clearly said here, I think uh, our political leader very clearly said, there is no hell and heaven. Very interesting. That brought me back to my mind a big debate I had to moderate at the last minute. This, the debate was, is there hell, is there heaven? And there are two sides arranged. One side, all youngsters <coughs> who have not gone to hell or heaven. And the other side, all elderly people expecting to go there soon. <laughs> and the fight went on. And a very brilliant brain in India was to moderate that late C. Subramanyam, whom I respect very much. Last minute, his flight got so delayed in Bombay, he couldn't reach Mangalore. So the organizers came and said, sir, there are only two hours for the debate and somebody has to moderate, and the moderator is not coming. Please come and moderate. You know, can you imagine that? So I went there without any idea whatsoever. So I heard both the sides. The youngsters were saying, now tell us, <clears throat> where is the proof, evidence, saying that there is heaven. Who has gone? The other side was saying, no, no, you don't know. As you grow old, you know where heaven is, where hell is, and you know, you must worry about that, and so on and so forth. It went on. It is 5.30 in the evening. So I told them, okay, now let's stop. <clears throat> Both of you have not seen hell or heaven. But this is a town hall. Just look out of the window. Poor children who have not had one meal a day, playing on the ground, filth, no, no proper cloths, clothes, and the dog is also lying there by the side. I said, that is hell. Now look at the inside of the town hall. You're all well fed. Just now you had a round of tea circulated, and you had biscuits, and you had a light lunch. This is heaven. Now, each one of you has to do one thing in life. That you are a good girl. Please try to convert a bit of that hell into heaven before you go from here. Wherever you go, you will do well. Because I was quoting D.H. Lawrence, who said, Our ingress into this world was naked and bare. Our progress in this world, trouble but care. Our egress from this world will be nobody knows where. If you do well here, you will do well there. So why worry where you go? Now a patient, dying patient is worried. I tell them, why are you worried? You are a good man. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. You will go to heaven and you should go there. You are very happy. That's where you wanted to go all your life. Supposing the account keeping in the God's book is slightly gone wrong. His chartered accountant was not honest. So you may go to hell. So what? So many of your friends are there. You are so happy there. <laughs> this is called consoling. Did you understand that? Now, one request I have for the government, and I've already spoken to the government, is not to have caste system in sickness care. We have this caste system, Western medicine, Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha, homeopathy, and what have you. All these do the same thing, cure rarely, comfort mostly, but console always. But do you know at the end what helps? It was said by again, by a great thinker, in medicine. Very great thinker, Lord Platt, who was a professor of medicine in London for a long time. He was like a colossus. He said, what is medicine ultimately? Coming to the two human beings. A man who is ill, man includes a woman also, I'm not using it as a species, not for sex. A man or a woman who is ill comes to seek the advice of another man or a woman in whom he has got confidence. The word confidence. And when you have confidence in the other person, you automatically get cured. So this coming together of human beings is the apex of medicine. All else will flow from that summit, whether it's Western medicine, Eastern medicine, homeopathy, umapathy, Ajurveda, anything. It all ultimately comes to two human beings trusting one another and having faith in one another. Now this a little while ago I was telling you, an elaborate study, a prospective study, which went for four years, done by four universities, Oxford, Cambridge, Hamburg, and Munich, led by the Oxford University Professor Bingel, showed very clearly, exhaustively, that ultimate curing is because of the faith, and not because of the medicine you use. Whether it's a Western chemical or homeopathy, 
the effect is the same. Did you get that? But there is one difference. Homeopathy will be very happy. What will happen to the reductionist chemical you put inside the system? Another extensive study was done in Washington University by a man called Douglas C. Wallace, D.C. Wallace. Anybody writing? Yes. This is the, the heading of this study was called Mitochondria as Qi. Qi is energy. Mitochondria as Qi. Now this man invented a computer chip called MIT chip, mitochondrial chip. And he tagged the chip onto every medicine that goes inside, whether it is aspirin to tukramycin, everything he tags. Now, and follows it computer-wise. When the medicine goes into the system, the system says, hey, I have not seen this. This is something new, so I have never seen this. So throw it, it must be poison, and it's immediately thrown to the liver. So every chemical that you put inside your system, mark my words, I'm repeating it, every chemical is put into a system. If it is a reductionist chemical, that is a part of it, removed, it goes to the liver for destroying. And every medicine you take, and second day you go and test your liver function test, it will be altered. Now eventually what happens after years of taking medicines, your liver goes into cirrhosis. And today we have an epidemic, which I didn't have when I was a medical student in the 50s, is called non-alcoholic cirrhosis. In the olden days, one chemical that was getting into the human system and destroying the liver was C2H, alcohol. Today, we have hundreds and thousands of these chemicals going in, in various forms, and they destroy your liver. Even yesterday morning, as I landed in Bangalore, somebody was waiting in the hotel for me and saying that, look, my brother has got non-alcoholic cirrhosis, he's bleeding, and they say he's useless. Can you do something? I said, only I can pray. Nothing more can be done. Because, you know, he has bled so many times, he's almost unconscious, he has got into hepatic encephalopathy. Nobody can do anything. We must know our limits. But friends, we can prevent these things by reducing the amount of chemicals you put into the system unnecessarily. This is my request. So, what we should do is, we need modern medicine. We need Western medicine for emergency care. But emergency care is 2% of the sick population in the world. 2%. Supposing I go out and meet with an accident. Now, God forbid. Now, I can't say I'll do yoga or I'll go into the pyramid and meditate. I'll come back to normal. No. Somebody has set my bones, right? So, after setting the bones, the healing can be enhanced inside the pyramid. Guruji is absolutely right. As the other person said, the blade which was inside the pyramid became sharper, so you could shave better. But most people in the concentration camp never shaved their face. So, you don't worry about that. Now, what happens here is, very interestingly, the Western medicine is needed for 2% of the population. So let us keep it as such. Let us not throw the baby and the bath water out because the bath water is dirty. The baby is not dirty. We need the baby. So let's keep it. Now, what's this disease diagnosis is our biggest disease. You are fine. You don't have any problem. You are very healthy, but you go for a checkup. Have you heard of this checkup? You read the British Medical Journal. There's a beautiful editorial which says, routine checkup of the apparently healthy is the most dangerous thing that can happen to mankind. <laughs> you are laughing. It's a very serious matter. Don't laugh because you are all in it. Now, why is this happening? Very simple. We will not have to go to quantum physics for that. Simple statistics. What is the height of India, male or Indian female for that matter? What do we do? We collect 1,000 males, take their height, and plot it on a graph. It becomes a Gaussian curve, a bell-shaped curve. You all know statistics a little, isn't it? So now, all these people are normal inside their curve. Did you understand that? But we take the mean plus two standard deviation as average, the middle. You put all this. There are people who are 4.6. There are people who are 6.2. Amitabh Bachchan. Jaya Bachchan, 4.6. You see that? Now we take a mean plus two standard deviation becomes 5.4. So we call normal. When did we start calling this as normal? Because we found there is business in it. What is the business? If you take the healthy population's average as disease population's normality, you get 25% on either side, which are called false positive. So for each parameter that you are checked in the, in the lab, there are 25% false positive. So if 100 people go for a checkup, 2,500 patients come out. 
So a professor of medicine in America, her, she was very much concerned because she was a very good girl. There are occasional good doctors in America also. She asked her best student in the class, who is a patient? Do you know what the student said? A man or a woman who goes to see a doctor becomes a patient. <laughs> she was shocked. She was literally shocked. She was so shocked, she was 52 years, and she said, if this is what I have taught my students, there is something wrong with our system. So she resigns her job at 52, and then, do you know what she did? She sat the MCAT examination. At 52, she joins her own medical college as a student to find out what is wrong with the medical education. And before that, before she could come out, my book had come out, What Doctors Don't Get to Study in Medical School. So she wrote me a letter. Had I seen your book, I wouldn't have wasted my time again sitting the MCAT and going through this. Do you know the next question she asked the student? When will he become a man or a woman again? The student shot back, rarely ever, comma, if ever, full stop. Modern medicines, Western medicines idea is not to cure your disease. If you have discovered a drug which cures a disease, they won't fund it. They want drugs which chronify your problem. I'll give you one example. How many diabetics are here? Raise your hand. Oh, good, good. Don't you worry. You're all, you're actually in a way better than normal people because according to some study done in Madras, you live 10 years longer than others. <laughs> now listen, aren't you told that you should eat only wheat? Chapati every day? Yes, sir. Do you know why? In the medical textbooks it is written that you must eat wheat only because wheat gluten is a direct poison to the pancreas beta cells. So if you start eating wheat, you are permanently a diabetic as long as you live. Even if you live 10 years extra, it's good business for them because 10 more years you will buy their medicines. Did you get that? But look at this poor rice. Brown rice has a cover which we call as taudu, which has got a chemical called metadicol, which is a treatment for diabetes. Question is how much you eat. So don't eat anything in excess, but what you love to eat. This is the best philosophy in life. Now, this is how we chronify disease. So, our biggest problem is diagnosis. An American professor at Yale, she wrote a beautiful study in the American Journal of Medicine, which is called the End of Disease Era. She said, if we go after diseases, all people will be sick. So, the whole population is sick for us to treat, which is a good catchment area, and we can make better business. But I have classified diseases differently for this talk. That's called emergency illness, which needs modern medicine, 2%. Minor illness syndromes, common cold, feverish cold, sore throat, and flu-like illness. Today, if you go to Bangalore City and find out, 90% of the people have upper respiratory infection in winter. On a given day in Europe, 55 million people, 55 million people cannot go to work because of feverish cold. You know feverish cold, Sita Jwara? Feverish cold is not common cold. There's two different entities. Let's not go into that because there's no time. So 50 million people don't go to work. And what happens to this 50 million? They're all given antibiotics so that their immune system changes and they become asthmatics after some time. And what a job loss, 50 million. But if you know simple homeopathy, extensive studies have been done in England on this. There are simple two drugs, Aram Trifilatum and Sambucus nigre. You can get relief in, in two hours, five minutes. The latest treatment for sore throat is very, very simple. Just sip hot water, hot water. Hot, H-O-T, not warm water, real hot water, not hot water. <laughs> Sit in a place, take a mug of hot water, sip, keep on sipping. When once you have raised your throat and head sent by one degree centigrade higher, the viruses die and you are okay. If you want to prevent this in winter, I will give you a simple prayer. Buy a bowl which is silver bowl or a silver glass, large glass. Keep water in that at night. Early morning you get up and drink that. You get nano silver which protects you from upper respiratory viruses. So 55 million people can go to work and you see the productivity in Europe. If 55 million in Europe can't go to work, imagine 
we are 1.3 crores. I mean, 1.3 billion. And 1.3 billion people, it must be at least about 100 million or a million people who are not able to go to work because of the cold, fever, etc., etc. So the next large chunk can make do with simple medicines. Three medicines I have given you. The next large chunk of disease is called what Paul was telling them about. Doctor thinks you have a disease syndrome. You have nothing. You go for a checkup. You are labeled. That disease is called doctor thinks you have a disease syndrome. You don't have a disease. Now one of the commonest diseases is you go for a checkup. Your cholesterol is on the higher side. Now for the last about 30 odd years, we have made cholesterol a ghost. But now I am very happy because I have been fighting against it, against all odds, saying that cholesterol is good, the more the merrier, longer you live, and you don't get cancer if you have higher cholesterol, because the, every cell wall is made of cholesterol, and if you don't have cholesterol, the cell wall is not made properly, and if the cell wall is not properly, you get cancer higher. Anyway, now the American government has cleared cholesterol, not as an enemy, but as a friend. With a beautiful picture in the Time magazine last month, with two bullseyes, egg bullseyes, and with some bacon through there, and said, best breakfast for you. And they said, don't fry your thing in oil, fry it in lard. Which means, cholesterol is good for you. That's a good sign. But anyway, now you go around the world and take a, in India, every other person is taking cholesterol-lowering drugs. Very dangerous. Cholesterol-lowering drugs are chemicals which block the normal enzymes in the liver. Imagine liver is your chemical factory without which you can't survive. And you knock off your liver and go about it, how can you survive? And everybody who takes the cholesterol-lowering drugs from the first drug, cholestromine, in the 50s to statins today, the end result is more people have met their maker in heaven faster. So if you want to enhance your exit from this world, one of the best things is to take cholesterol-lowering drugs. A study in France recently showed that women who are more than 90 years in the old nursing homes, their cholesterols are in 800, 900, 700 range. They're very healthy. And nobody has checked them, luckily. Luckily. <laughs> now there is another, this is about 10% of the population is doctor thinks you have a disease syndrome. Because normal, Amitabh Bachchan goes for a checkup. Is he normal? No, he's not 5.4. What's our treatment? Cut his leg, make him 5.4. <laughs> then next day, Jaya Bachchan goes for a checkup. Is she normal? No, 4.6. What's the treatment? Transplant that leg to her. <laughs> As now my friend Paul was saying, this beautiful girl, Angelina Jolie, poor thing. Paul, is he here? He did very well. Give him a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Where is he? Angelina Jolie was told by her geneticist that you have genes which might give you a, a breast cancer. So why have the breast? Why do women have the breast when you are young to attract a male and when you are in the middle age to feed your child? When you have done both, get rid of it so that your risk of cancer is gone. So she was told and foolish girl, she agreed and had her breast removed. Then one job for the breast surgeon. Then the ready plastic surgeon is there to reconstruct a more beautiful breast. And that was done. Then I wrote an article saying that this foolish girl unfortunately has lost her breast, but doesn't matter, it's good for the industry because as Paul rightly said, genes have no role to play in our life. It is the environment that has everything to do. That's called epigenetics, about the genes. And because human chromosome, you know, one which holds the gene, has only 23,000 human genes but two and a half trillion germ genes. Which means you are more of a germ's child than your parent's child. <laughs> if you want to know we'll get cancer or not, you must study all those germs' ancestors. <laughs> a literal... But we don't say that. You know, this genetics has died long back. But we still do genetic engineering because there's a big business. Epigenetics, if you t talk, it, not, there's no business there. So now we come back to our genes. These are not our enemies, they are our friends. And you would be surprised to know that meditation, which Guruji has taught you, you do it daily, 
the, your chromosomes have got two shoe knots on the other side. They are called telomeres. It's like the shoe has a shoelace core either and a metal ring. Metal ring. To keep the chromosomes genes together, they got two rings at the either side. This is called telomeres. As you age older, this becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. When it becomes very small, you are dead. Now meditation makes it longer, longer, longer and longer. <laughs> Epigenetics tells you that is what is called gene penetrance. You may have a gene, but that doesn't produce disease. The, if the environment is conducive, then the gene can penetrate and produce disease. This gene penetrance depends on the environment. And the environment depends on tranquility of mind. And the tranquility of mind is what yoga says, chitta, vritti, nirodha, yoga. So meditation will make you tranquil, irrespective of what method of I have a simple method of meditation. Simply sit quietly, close your eyes in a quiet place, don't pick up your phone, and don't react to anything. And just 20 minutes later, you open your eyes, you're so tranquil. A study was done in an industry in Vijayawada. There's an industry called Siri industry. And 2,000 people worked there. So the chairman one day thought, he gave them half an hour free in the morning as they come. And he built a big hall. And he himself came, old man, 80 years. And he took a mic and said, all of you close your eyes for five minutes and say, Om after me. And everybody did that. His director said, you know, you're losing unnecessary half an hour. That means 1,000 hours gone and you'll lose your business. But on the contrary, his business improved. But what he found was, a lot of them were not closing their eyes. They had a holiday, you know. Then he said, if you keep your eyes closed for half an hour, just keep your eyes closed for half an hour, you'll get 10 rupees extra in the pay. 100% compliance. They were keeping it closed for, closed for longer than five minutes. See, this shows you our obsession about money. Anyway, that's, that's a big thing. He has done a lot of other work. And he has even studied how to teach a child in the womb. He has got a large population of women. And when they're pregnant, he gives them three hours of time and shows them beautiful movies so that the child gets educated. And he has shown how the whole thing can be taught. Now, we come back to the third generation, the fourth class of diseases. Doctor thinks you have a disease syndrome is one class, 10%. Then patient thinks she or he has a disease syndrome, 20%. All of you think, I have, you become hypochondriac because we live in the midst of sickness care city center. You open a magazine in the morning, you see, oh, somebody has died of this disease or that disease. You look at the television, you see only bad news. You go out and you get the only bad news. You see advertisement of drugs for every disease and they frighten you out of your wits. So much so, you become a hypochondriac and you suspect you think you have a disease. Because if somebody you have seen dying of breathlessness, you start thinking you have breathlessness. Now this also does not require drugs. This requires only tranquility. Then we have what are called incurable diseases. Cancer is not a curable disease at all. Cancer can be prevented but not cured. And so, but today, the biggest industry is cancer industry, which is trying to cure cancer. This can't be done. So the last thing that is patient thinks he or she has a disease syndrome also requires only treatment of the mind. I'll come back to that. Now then, then the incurable diseases, they require palliation. What does it require? Comfort. And encouragement. If you encourage them and their mind can cure cancer. I've got any number of examples, recorded examples, published examples. The mind can cure cancer. The last is chronic illnesses, like rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of autoimmune diseases, they're all chronic diseases. And what do we have? Steroid, for everything steroid. You give them steroid, after some time they get diabetes, they get broken bones, they get their kidneys damaged, and they die of infection. No, on the contrary, what is autoimmune disease? Why do your own body cells hate your own body cells? Now you go back to the origin of the human body. I just gave you a glimpse when Guruji came and put his shoulders on my, on my, uh, his hands on my shoulders, so I couldn't go further. I'll now tell you, you are a colony of 100 trillion human beings. They're all cells. Each one of these cells loves another cell in the vicinity and loves all the cells because 
you are all, we are all one family. Did you know that? He is my first cousin, Karthikeyan, because we spend most time together. Why cousin? His energy and my energy originally is the same energy, universal energy. So he is my best relative. So my cells love Karthikeyan cells. Okay, did you understand now? We all love one another and it's love that keeps us going. Now some of us start hating another person. How to get Karthikeyan down from the CBI chair and how do I sit on the Karthikeyan's chair? Then I start working on that. Our politicians are very good at that. Now when I start working at that, do you know what happens? Our cells get confused. I love Karthikeyan cells. Why is my owner hating Karthikeyan? Did you get that? And if you continue to do that, they start hating my own cells. This is the cause of autoimmune disease, which Paul Ehrlich called horror autotoxicus. So what is the treatment? You just, I, I have many number of patients, you just tell them, okay, now go back home, sit in a quiet room, and think who all you hate in this world. Make a list, come back to me, and we will start loving them. And you would be surprised, rheumatoid arthritis patients, joints go away. There's a big, big man in America, big man in America. He had a worst autonomic nervous system, I mean, the, the uh, auto uh, uh, immune disease. Norman Cousins. Norman Cousins was a very famous journalist in the Kennedy Khrushchev era. And he goes for covering the Kennedy Khrushchev meeting in Moscow on a wintry December morning, when they get out of the plane, the, the temperature was minus 42 degrees centigrade. And as he was walking, a jet was turning on the other side, and that hot jet wave hit him. So he thought his disease started there. He started having pain in the joints. He came back to Boston and went to Harvard. They said, look, you've got one of the worst autoimmune diseases called ankylosing spondylitis. You will freeze, 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 become a ro like a rock and die. We can't do anything. So get admitted to the hospital, live here. <clears throat> so he lived there, waiting to die. Suddenly his friends came. He was a very famous journalist, Norman Cousins. Then they came and each one started joking about something, just to you know, divert his attention. They joked and joked and joked and he found out whom all he hated. And he started laughing and laughing and laughing. Then they brought a 16mm movie camera into the, because those days there was no television. This idiot box set was not born. So then he laughed all Charlie Chaplin movies and all. And he saw his fingers moving. Then gradually his hands moving. Then he sat up in the bed. And three months later he went home. Instead of going to the cemetery, he went home, lived for another 25 years and died. He wrote a beautiful book for you. Please read that. Anatomy of an Illness. What's the book's name? Anatomy of an Illness. It is a small book, seven dollars, hundred pages. You can read it in one hour if you read seriously. And his name is Norman Cousins. N-O-R-M-A-N, C-O-U-S-S-I-N, Cousin. And now I'll tell. I was telling you about these drugs. What happens when you put the drugs unnecessarily into your system? They destroy the liver. But when you put a herbal drug, here comes Ayurveda. A herbal drug. Body says, Ah, this I know. This is my usual food. You know, my ancestors also used to take it. So it's absorbed. And if it does any good, it does any good, but it doesn't do any harm. Did you get the difference? I'll give you an example. There were these young boys in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research doing the usual Western thing. They started reading my foolish ideas, and then they said, why not we do the holistic research? So they took one herb, Brahmi. You know Brahmi? Ek patta. My grandmother used to give me Brahmi chutney before I went for the exam. And I used to think my grandmother is very big at that time. Then I became a doctor. I said, oh, foolish lady, why did she give the chutney to me? These boys made chutney out of Brahmi. Because there are so many studies of Brahmi extract, reductionism of Brahmi. Nothing happened. They made the chutney and gave it to rats. Six months later, they found these rats are so brilliant. You put them in any maze, they come out. <laughs> they were shocked. So they cut the, uh, killed the rat and cut the brain and they found the hippocampus major had become very big. That's the area where memory is stored. And it's three times its size. Then they cut the hippocampus major and looked at it. The cells were so active and so proliferative that the brain really changes with whole Brahmi but not reduction.